Good morning and welcome to the Real Wealth Solutions Podcast. Joining me today, uh, instead of the usual Darren Light, we have Kim from the upstairs satellite office of Real Wealth Solutions <laughs> Central Johnson City branch. Uh, good morning, Kim. Good morning. And also joining us, Alex Brashears of, good morning. Uh, of Infinite Road Investments. Uh, we're talking to Alice this morning because uh, she has kind of a more of an emphasis on the limited partner side of it, at least for now, and some, and some passing investing and some alternative investment strategies, specifically private lending. So um, welcome, Alex. Uh, good morning. If, if you don't mind, could you do the, the, quick, the quick bio and then we'll, we'll jump right into it? Absolutely. So just a little bit about me. Uh, I am a military spouse. I've been married to the military for almost 20 years now. So we're there uh, at the home run. Uh, I have been investing as a either active investor or passive investor, I would say off and on over that time span, just depending on where we are in our life, where we're physically located in our life. We've kind of done the, the fix and flip, the buy and hold. Uh, we quickly moved on from that because that we discovered that was not in our skill set or met our goals. And then now we primarily focus on private lending for fix and flips in the Hampton Roads market here in Virginia. And we also invest in syndications as a limited partner because we like having that kind of ownership aspect, both from kind of a mental standpoint, like you can point at a building and go, you know, I'm part owner of this building. And also from the tax standpoint, because we are that part owner. So we kind of get to use some of that cost segregation, bonus depreciation to our benefit come tax time. But I also have recently gotten involved in a fund, a regulation A plus fund that's going to be helping military members, veterans, and their families invest in real estate, uh, multifamily real estate, starting in the Hampton Roads market and then kind of expanding north and south up and down the 95 corridor because we're very close to the capital of Virginia, which is Richmond. We're very close to DC. Uh, Alexandria, Virginia is a suburb of DC and then kind of heading south into the Carolinas as well. That, that core southeastern market that everybody likes Okay, right on. And uh, let's pick something right out of your LinkedIn bio that attracted my eye. And it was, uh, I invest passively so I can live actively, which I think is the holy grail of what a lot of us are trying to do is uh, have our, our success from real estate fuel our lifestyle instead of our lifestyle being uh, limited by the location of a W-2 job or something close to that but even in just in the military part of your living actively like you said before we started coming on you jumped around to what was it 19 different locations 19 in different address yep, so I mean, you know it was it would have been difficult for you to be the the quote-unquote active investor to buy a sixplex and self-manage it and something because you might have been somewhere else in in six or seven months. So can you just speak to that a little bit? I mean, the, the, the passive thing almost became a function of your lifestyle. Absolutely. It did. Uh, because so first off, just so I, everybody has kind of a baseline vocabulary for me, what I consider active and passive is a little bit different than what most people would consider active and passive. So my definition of active is you have to be involved right then, whether or not you want to be or not. And then passive is you have the choice to be as involved as you want when you want. So I, because I don't like people to think that passive means you do nothing, you know, like passive tends to get the connotation. You kind of sit back and collect your mailbox money and you don't worry about anything or you don't have anything really to do. Whereas you can be a quote unquote active passive investor. And that's kind of where the space I consider myself in. So, you know, like you mentioned with the military, you know, we've lived places you know, anywhere from three months, the longest we've lived anywhere so far is 22 months. And that's where I'm currently living in Virginia. And in that time frame, real estate tends to be pretty slow going. You know, even if you put an offer on a property, you know, you might be in escrow for 30 days, maybe 60 days. If it's a large commercial property, it might be six months while you're trying to hammer out different aspects of the deal. So if you're only going to be living there, so X amount of months, and you're measuring your time in months, not years living someplace, that really starts to narrow down your possibilities in a reasonable fashion. Um, you know, 20 years ago, 
remote investing was not nearly as commonplace as it is now that, you know, COVID's kind of pushed us into the true digital age. Um, so, you know, the idea of investing somewhere that was three time zones away that I had never been, didn't know anybody, didn't really have the resources or ability to invest in that market or research that market, uh, that really limits what you can possibly do. And at the same token, you're not building a career because you're moving every several months. Uh, so you really kind of have to, it forces you to really think, okay, what can I do to empower myself to help my family financially while we're bouncing around the country? Because that's, that, you know, it's not that the military made me move. It's I chose to stick with my spouse and make our marriage a priority. So having that as my number one priority, what can I do to make my number two priority of having some level of financial freedom also happen? Mm -hmm. I like how when you talked about it, you talked about like the style of your real estate investing and how that fits into your lifestyle. So how you choose to invest fits into how you choose to live. Absolutely. And I, I like think a lot of people kind of think, you know, like in the multifamily space, you know, there's like, oh, I'm going to get 500 doors this year and I'm going to be a GP and I'm going to make the jump from LP to GP and I'm going to get 500 doors in my first year. And like, okay, that's great. 500 doors just means you outbid everybody else. What I'm concerned about is, did you, you know, are you effectively working these properties? Are you doing distributions to your LP partners as agreed upon in your, your pro forma and your pitch deck? Um, so I think there's a lot of kind of pressure or maybe even just emphasis put on the number of doors. And I don't think people really think about the responsibility that comes with 500 doors. I mean, I've, I've talked with active investors and they're like, oh yeah, I'm just going to get 20 single family homes. I'm going to buy a new house every year and then rent it out. And then, you know, when I retire in 20 years from the military, I'll have 20 single family homes and that'll be my passive income. And I'm like, yeah, okay. That's not going to be nearly as passive as you're thinking because, you know, you better have great sell signal and a lot of really good boots on the ground in multiple markets from your hut in Tahiti, if that's your goal, because they're right. still going to have to babysit property managers. Just, you know, you know, that's on the small side. If something major goes wrong, you're probably going to have to be babysitting property managers and contractors. So it really becomes a conversation of what do you want your life to look like and then start backing up the processes that would support that vision. Yeah, absolutely. Well, why? I mean, let's go back to like very fundamentally, why real estate? Because you could do, I mean, you could do dividend stocks and, and produce some income and be, you know, like extremely passive in that way. And you could just sit back with an E-Trade account and, you know, and chill in your and we have we have done that and we do we still have dividend stocks um but i'm generally not a big fan kind of less so nowadays of the stock market i just don't trust it i don't trust that you know if elon musk comes down and says you know starbucks is terrible and you happen to own starbucks stock you did absolutely nothing the company did nothing the fundamentals didn't change but just the fact that somebody that's got 12 million followers you know, makes a negative re remark about your, your asset because you're owning this stock, you know, it plummets. It's, I don't like that volatility aspect to it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very kind of personable. I want to be able, you know, to kind of walk by a building or drive by a building and say, you know, I'm, I'm a part owner of that building. And I know, you know, again, going back to real estate, kind of being a slow, illiquid asset, you know, it doesn't matter what Elon Musk says about my building, you know, people are still going to pay their rent, you know, they're still going to carry on their normal lives, you know, they're, they have families in those units, they're going to have their Thanksgiving dinners in those units, they don't care what Elon Musk says about the building. Um, and, you not even, and you can affect it. And you can affect, affect it. that building. Even Absolutely. as a limited partner, you can, by, I would guess, by choosing who you invest with. Absolutely. You can choose what that looks like moving forward. So you have even as a limited partner, some sort of control based on who you choose. Absolutely. And I feel like that doesn't get mentioned enough for LPs that it's like, oh, we have no control in the deal. It's like, you absolutely have control of the deal. You know, if you have the ability, the empowerment to choose where you invest, why you invest, who you invest with, um, how much contact you have with them. Like some of the operators I know, I literally can jump on a weekly Zoom call and just chat with them like other human beings. It doesn't even have to be real estate related. You know, so, I mean, it's, it's a very collaborative environment. And I think LPs maybe don't fully embrace that, that, you know, if you are working on a team with other people, maybe other LPs that, you know, maybe it's the GP team you really, really like. It's a community of people literally going out to help another community of people. 
Oh, that's interesting because that was one of my questions a little further down was, uh, and I had, I had phrased it, any problem with the lack of control of being an LP? Because, you know, I, it could be argued that, you you know, you can't go in and make day-to-day -day decisions, but you'd bring up a very good point. You could be active up until the point of the acquisition. You can choose the market. You can choose your sponsor. You can choose the business plan. You can choose... Uh, well, whatever, whatever the other factors are of a particular investment. Although at some point when you are an LP, you, you, you are turning over to day-to-day -day management to a sponsorship team. But yeah, up until that point, you could be very specific about yeah, uh, and how you want to approach it. I would say it comes from a place of, I know what their skill set is and I know what my skill set is. Do I want to have to con have conversations with tenants? No. Do I want to have to pick out flooring? No. Do I want to have to pick out the paint on the walls? No. Like I'm from New Orleans. You let me decorate anything. It's going to be purple, green, and gold. Like that's just, that's just how it goes. So <laughs> like, I'm not a landscape designer, but they could, the GP team can go and, you know, if they work in a specific market, they might have those vendors kind of in their quote unquote Rolodex and just be able to dial up and say, hey, we need a landscape design for a new rec center. We're building an apartment complex or a new playground or a new dog park. Like, I don't want to do that. Like, I, if I wanted to do that, I would be an active investor, but I, that's just not my area. That's not what I enjoy. So I think really, it's not so much a matter of what I can and can't control. It's a matter of what I do enjoy and what I don't enjoy. And decorating and talking to tenants and, you know, handling contractors with major repairs for if you're doing a major, you know, heavy lift value add type project. No, I don't want to do that. That's not what I enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, how do you vet sponsors then or, or a potential? We'll get into the private lending side of it. That was another question related to that. how do you vet a sponsor? How do you vet a potential borrower? If you're, then, if you're, you know, on the private lending side. The, the process is remarkably similar in my eyes. Uh, the thing I like about the passive investing space is it tends to be very collaborative. You know, you're not out there by yourself putting bandit sides on the side of the road. We'll buy a house in any condition in your phone number. And you're trying to beat out other wholesalers or, you know, be the first one on MLS to make an offer for on a property. It's like the vast majority of talking 99% of the people I come across in the, in the passive investing space uh, are very, very collaborative, very willing to help, you know, very wanting to get involved. So what I'm looking for, for both a potential borrower and a, a you know, GP sponsorship team that I want to work with is they need to have that kind of moral compass of adding value. You know, even if I'm not going to do business with you right now, I'm still going to connect you with someone, you know, I don't have a deal right now, but it sounds like you're a great fit for me as an LP investor, but I know someone else who has a deal right now that I think is very similar to what you're looking for. I'll refer you over, you know, those sorts of kind of value add service, you know, servant leader mentality. I want that first and foremost. I want someone that's, you know, has what I feel is my best interest at heart. That's going to be huge. Cause if you think about if they're running a building or a complex, that's 200 units, you know, I want to make sure that they have the ability to have empathy and kind of that bigger, broader picture. It's not just, I'm out there to raise capital to get this deal closed. And I've met operators like that, you know, they, you start off the interview, you know, that because of a 506B, for example, you have to have those initial, you know, conversations. So you start out that kind of initial conversation. They don't remember your name. You know, you mentioned the fact you're a military spouse like three times and then they're like, oh, what do you do for a living? Okay, look, we just had this conversation. I don't have a career because I'm a military spouse. You know, it's, when they when they miss details like that. It's not so much that they're not paying attention to me, but they can't pay attention to details. And as you guys know, if you're running a property that's 100 units, 200 units, there's a lot of details to keep track of. So I would say those are my two big ones as far as like initial contact for both borrowers and GP sponsorship teams is I want to see they have that moral compass of like having a servant leader and that they're going to pay attention to the details. Yeah. And like that servant leader thing was something that I was pleasantly surprised to find in the real estate community it is very giving at least in our experience yes mm -hmm. you do occasionally run into people that are a little What's more for protective <laughs> yeah or whatever but yeah you see that all the time it's like oh you know you get on a an initial call to see if there might be some kind of alignment and you just find out that you know we're we invest in a mid-atlantic but your interest is 
the Texas market. I'm like, well, I know people that are syndicating in Texas. Let me refer you over to them. And it's just a great mentality because if, if you just want the industry to be successful. So if, as, as an industry, it doesn't have to necessarily you, you want in your backyard too, but you know, if everybody's grown and things are going well, it's like with contractors. You, know, you don't always want to necessarily have the cheapest contractor because you need these people to have profitable businesses so that they continue to be able to provide a service. So no, absolutely. I well, I think it's also looking at people as humans and as people yeah. rather than a commodity rather than a potential investor or a potential partner or a potential contractor. This is a human being and I want to learn to get to know them and what they need. And, yeah. and, often, and often things cross in unexpected ways and by treating people like people and humans rather than a commodity, you discover things that you probably wouldn't if you just stuck to, what can this person do for me? Absolutely. And I mean, there's a GP team I have not invested with financially yet, but I just because the, the deals that they've had so far don't meet what I'm looking for personally, but I love them as a GP team and I will invest with them every time they have, they have a pitch deck out. I will happily watch it and see if it fits my parameters. Um, but, you know, I, I still speak to them regularly. You know, I refer them up to other, other investors to them, other LP investors. And I'm like, Hey, you know, these guys are great. I personally would invest with them. I have not yet. I'm very upfront about that. Um, but I mean, it's, it's just one of those things. Like we started off the conversation, very genuine. I know them as people, they know me as people. And, and we just kind of move forward with that, even though I haven't financially kind of coughed up the dough, shall we say, uh, to invest with them as an LP officially, you know, we're still very involved together, collaboratively working on other things kind of behind the scenes. I'm going to ask a super, I don't know, self-serving, I guess, question. As an LP, what do you look for in a pitch deck? What do you want to see in a pitch deck? I, I really hate the hype. Like that's, that's the number one thing I don't want to see. If people, you know, if there's eight GPs on this, on this team, that's going to question, I'm going to, from the very beginning, if it's all like, here's these eight most awesome operators ever, and here's all the deals and here's all the door counts. And I'm like, okay, something's wrong. Like that's my, because <laughs> a lot of pitch decks start that way with here's our eight people and here's what they do. And here's all the awesome stuff they've done in the past. And yes, experience does kind of account for, you know, a major component of the deal. Cause it doesn't matter numerically how great the deal is. If you don't have those people that get along and can actually execute that business plan, it doesn't matter. Um, but whenever, whenever operators start out with this, like, you know, there's, eight, 10, 12 people on a, on a GP side, you know, and everybody's awesome. And this guy's got 2000 door count and this guy's got 800 door count. And I'm like, I don't care. Again, I don't care about the door count. I want to know how well did you stick to your previous pro formas in your past deal? So if you close 2000 doors, what's kind of the status of that 2000 doors now is what I really want to know. And there's not a lot of time in a pitch deck to kind of go through that. So I know that's kind of an unrealistic expectation, but when you kind of start with that off the bat, it's like, I, I just, I don't care. Like, I think that should be towards the end of a pitch deck, you know, yes, introduce everybody that's on the call, but I just, I just, again, cause that's something I'm going to go do personally. I'm going to go talk out, reach out to those GP people and I'm going to talk to them individually. So as long as I have their you know, picture and a contact information, you know, I'll screenshot it or write it down or whatever. And I'll reach out to them individually. I don't need a 30 minute conversation of how great the GP team is. You know, it's, that's just, that's just, it is what it is. Um, well, let's, uh, if you don't, let's take a step back. Cause there, if you're a potential LP or, you know, there's, a lot of people in a similar position that you are military spouse jumping around can't really have the benefit of investing in their backyard if you're interested in getting uh into people's uh email list or learn i mean how how would you recommend somebody trying to dip their toe into potentially working with gps like get started like get on linkedin search these people out look at their content i mean what would you say would be you know the kind of the warm up period to, to start vetting people out. Um, I would honestly, I work in the terms of months, you know, I will, okay. you know, follow an operator, whether they have a podcast, whether they, you know, go to social media routinely, whether they host a monthly meetup, you know, they're, they have a YouTube channel, whatever those things are. I will personally follow them for a couple months 
because I want to hear their rhetoric. I want to hear their story. I want to hear their experiences because again, the execution of the property, you know, of that business plan for that property is really what's going to drive the distributions for me as an LP investor. So it's generally, I'm not going to be someone that's like, yeah, I, I watched this amazing pitch deck. And then 10 minutes later, you're getting a $50,000 soft commit. If I've never heard from you, like I do know LP investors that will do that. But for me personally, and maybe it's just a, a female investor thing. Like I want to make sure that the, you know, the eyes are crossed, the eyes are dotted and the T's are crossed and that certain metrics are kind of there. Um, I know several LPs that they kind of look at three numbers, you know, the, they want the, their IRR, they want their cash on cash return, they want their equity multiple, and they'll hold deals side by side looking at those three numbers. And, you know, they're like, well, which one do you like? And I'm like, I don't care what those numbers are personally. You know, I, I think anybody that's an experienced LP investor, you realize that, you know, a, a investor, a GP team can put together anything they want on a pro forma, they could do a 22% IRR and there is no legal responsibility or, you know, repercussions for putting on a 22% IRR, but then delivering an eight, you know, there's, there's nothing, you know, there's like the SEC is not going to come down on them and say, you promised these investors a 22% IRR and you didn't deliver bad shame on you. You can't do any more deals. I don't know. I don't think a lot of LP, a, a newer LP investors really realize that they focus in on those three numbers and they think that's like, you know, that's what's happening. And I'm like, we don't live in spreadsheets. We live in the real world. So I'm more concerned about who they are as a person, as opposed to what the pitch deck numbers, you know, yes, I want to see kind of conservative underwriting. I want to see, you know, you're not doing four and 5% rent bumps, you know, over the next two years, especially during the COVID era. So I want a little more conservative underwriting, but Again, underwriting is literally that life in a spreadsheet. We don't live in a spreadsheet. So I don't place a whole lot of emphasis on those three numbers. Yeah, that's a great point because I'm the spreadsheet jockey, <laughs> you know, for <laughs> a lot of our partnership. And it's something that I wouldn't say I struggle with because it's, I mean, we're doing projections into the future. Yep. And I'm very weary about people celebrating our projections as if they have been achieved. And it's certainly what we want to do. We, we certainly think it's a reasonable business plan. We're trying to be conservative, trying to account for everything in the right spot at the right time, but life happens, you know, all the time. And, and that is, that is one big thing that I, I don't know, don't like to see as people, putting out their projected returns as if they had already achieved them. So, yes. Whatever, yes. Sidebar. I mean, buildings catch fire. We had, there's an operator. Yeah. I know that six weeks after they bought the building, 40% of it was unoccupied because of a fire and water damage. So, you know, it's like, it, it was a great asset. It was a great business plan, but obviously the business plan has been set back several months from what right. they were going to be doing pro forma wise because they had a fire. Yeah, and now you really find out how to, how well is this person operating? Because yeah. did he have income protection as part of his insurance policy? Or right. Did he forego that to save a little bit of money? I mean, right. you know, it's like, and that's unfortunate. Yeah, when things go sideways, that's when and you that really was, find out it, what somebody is, uh, you know, how well prepared they are. I mean, that one was intentionally started by a tenant. Like, does anybody uh, does anybody like uh, put that into their pro forma that their tenants are going to light the place on fire? Like, that's just generally not even in their in their thought process. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's so, right. or even just like with the pandemic and you know, mass or significant uh, decreases in rents in you know San Francisco and stuff like that. I mean, they were doing great. Yep. And then like on a dime, it just, so yeah, see how these people are able to operate their way through it. We'll, we'll see what happens. Hey, it's Greg from Real Wealth Solutions. If you'd like to know more about our passive income opportunities, jump on to realwealth.solutions and hit that schedule a call button. We're always happy to talk about our multifamily and flip projects and to answer any questions you may have. Again, that's realwealth.solutions. We look forward to hearing from you. And now, back to the podcast. Um, let's switch modes a little bit to private money. Because this, uh, this is something that you also do. This is through Infinite Road Investments, correct? So that's it one is. of the enti entities that you have. 
this seems to be more of like the active passive type combination because private money for people that listen, they might not realize is individuals basically loaning money to other individuals, um, typically on projects that wouldn't fit into regular institutional style lending portfolio. So flips comes to mind, heavy rehabs, you're providing uh, funding, usually at a premium compared to market rates, but it's because there's significantly or can be significantly more risk, but also, um, you know, high rewards. Um, talk a little bit about the uh, infinite road investments, you know, what, what you do with private lending and how you fit that into, you know, your personal objectives with real estate investing because you, you got the slow road and the quick road and the, the private lending is more of the quick road yeah as far as real estate goes i would say yeah a little bit more yeah. of the quick road um but there's kind of two different facets to the private lending so yes i actually do private lending i do private lending for fix and flips in the hampton roads area with very specific metrics um that's probably a little bit beyond this conversation for the for this podcast um, but the other component that I do is I actually have an educational Facebook group called Private Lending Lessons that teaches other people how to do private lending and passive investing like in a syndication. Because when I got into the private lending space, there was very little information on how to actually do it. So everybody's heard of Bigger Pockets, you know, and Bigger Pockets has books on, you know, how do you uh, come up with your scope of work for your rehab, you know, own an apartment building in 30 days and, you know, how to do, how, they have all these calculators and how to do these things. And really the only way private lending is mentioned is go find a private lender to fund your deals. And it's like, that's yeah. not exactly how it works, but it leaves, <laughs> it leaves a big group of people that like, okay, that's great. Even as an active investor, like uh, the more I kind of talked with active investors, the more I realized they had no idea what private lending actually was, what private money was. Uh, a lot of active investors I've specifically talked to, they thought it was like a down payment assistance program. You know, like the bank wants me to put 20% down on my on my duplex. Do you guys do that? And I'm like, no, that's not how this works at all. Um, so it was when I went out looking for community because COVID shut the world down here in Virginia about mid-March last year. So we're going on almost a year now. And you know, there's, there's all these Facebook groups for, you know, the Burr method and syndication and all these other things, but every group I joined that had private money, hard money, you know, whatever in the title was just basically a place for scam and spams. There was nothing, you know, networking based, education based. There was no one having conversations, you know, what can you do to mitigate your risk? You know, how would you do this? How could you set this up? You know, how would you underwrite this? And I'm like, all right, well, because I'm a military spouse and I don't live anywhere long, I don't have the luxury of waiting around and looking for something. So if I can't find a tribe, let's build one. So somebody said, why don't you start a Facebook group? And I'm like, sure, you know, off, off a whim, you know, my normal W2 job is I'm a chemistry professor. So I had no background in marketing and business and accounting. I'm like, let's just start this community. Sure. Let's do this. And then like a hundred, you know, a hundred people were in there a week later. And I'm like, Oh crap, I guess we got to do something with this. Yeah, you got to produce you know? some content now. <laughs> and, yeah. now and now the group's uh, you know, about eight months old and there's uh, just under 2,500 people in there. And it's, it's like, okay, well, this evidently was needed. You know, there was needed to be some education about private lending and passive investing. Um, and so, I mean, that has been just kind of a game changer for me personally. It's allowed me to connect to other people that are doing this. Because a lot of people that are involved in syndication also do some of the private lending because the two worlds kind of mesh really well from like an income and a tax standpoint. You can be on the debt and the equity side of the equation and in, in two different processes. Um, so, I mean, it, it just really kind of naturally fits. And then I've, I've met people literally from all over the world that invest here in the United States or maybe they're active duty service members stationed overseas and they're best in, investing here in the United States. And it's just been an opportunity for people to get in a quote unquote room with other people that are doing the style of investing that they are doing and be able to bounce ideas. And, Hey, I have this guy who's, you know, got a sales job. How do I vet what his income actually is? You know, and here's what he submitted and what do I ask for and what questions do I ask? Um, and it's that same kind of conversation that's happening on the LP side where LPs are able to have kind of have a community um, you know, regardless of operators, because I know a lot of operators will kind of start their own Facebook community to teach people about private or passive investing in the LP syndication side. 
but obviously it's always kind of under the umbrella of, you know, whatever your entity is offering the, the value, you know, obviously. Uh, whereas this is kind of more neutral ground, we actually have operators come in and talk to the group and just kind of present, here's what, here's some, you know, some facet of multifamily investing, here's some facet of industrial investing, here's some facet of, of retail, you know, whatever it happens to be. So it's a space, a neutral space for LP investors to also kind of get together and have a conversation about, you know, how do you vet, you know, a, a GP sponsorship team? You know, what are you going to a website? Are you doing a background check? You know, having those conversations in a neutral space, not underneath the umbrella of a specific operator is really what that group offers. Yeah, that's all. I mean, you hear that a lot. It's like, how can I get involved in, you know, networking or whatever? A lot of times we just recommend just be a facilitator. And that sounds like what you initially started out with providing this Facebook group was just a space. Mm -hmm. So you fill the void of the space and gave people an opportunity to to use it to get together within a, a common theme, basically. And that's like maintain with meetups. It. Yeah. And then you maintain it. And I you, mean, that's the yeah, thing. A lot right. of people start groups and then yeah. never post anything to it or don't and keep encouraging the engagement and that's that's the secret sauce i mean that's the magic trick yeah right it's just uh you don't have to be like the complete knowledge base of everything private lending but you can yep. bring people into the space that can talk to specific aspects of it to the group so kudos to you for doing that i think i'm yeah. part of it I, yeah because we do some flips and we've been on the borrowing side of the private lending side, but I really can't figure out if I was to be, you know, hey, can I borrow some money to help do flip? I'm like, I would have no idea how to protect myself. Yeah. yeah. And and that's a yeah. very common theme. Um, and it's also something that I feel like something I'm particularly proud of with the group is over 50% of the group is women. And if anybody remembers going to real estate groups in person, you know, hopefully we'll be able to do that again this year. Um, traditionally, the room is not 50% women. And even when you go, the, the women in the room tend to be in more of a support role. You know, they're the realtor, not the owner. You know, they're a, a loan processor, not the lender. Um, so I think really giving that voice to passive investing as a way of being kind of actively involved in your investing life, your, your investing community, uh, really speaks to a lot of women. It's particularly, you know, for LP syndication, if you think about it, like it doesn't, active investing doesn't necessarily speak to women because it's like, if we're running a household and we have kids, you know, maybe three different kids on three different Zoom things doing school virtually, and we are potentially have our own jobs. And then we also potentially have a spouse that's working from home or deployed in my case. Um, you know, the last thing we want is to be driving around putting bandit signs on the corner, right. you know, we'll, we'll buy your house in any condition, you know, we are not going to answer the phone call at two in the morning from a distressed seller like we just, that's one more tornado we do not need to add to this system. So whereas LP syndication investing, you know, that's something I can sit down and when I have, you know, maybe an hour free, I can sit down and I can do a little research on a GP, I can do a little research on a market, I can do a little, 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 and it's kind of front end heavy as far as the work goes. But like you mentioned earlier, once the capital is deployed, you know, that, that tornado of activity is kind of put on the back burner. And from that point forward, you can be as involved as you want. If you want to get in on the weekly Zoom calls, you can do that. If you just want to read the quarterly update emails, feel free. If you don't want to read them and you just want your distributions to show up quarterly, you know, you're free to do that too. So I think that that aspect alone, I think really speaks uh, volumes to, to women investors. You know, we're, we're still actively involved, but it's not adding another tornado to our life. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, yeah. It, that flexibility. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the LP stuff of the active, combination passive i think lands a little bit more on the passive side i would say the private lending probably lands a little bit more on the active side because things are just on a shorter timeline so just mm -hmm. comparison contrast you know the syndications you might be into it for five years yep you know and that's usually the typical projection for for a hold on a multifamily syndication is you know five years could be seven years now as returns start to get compressed, but um, the private lending, you know, what's your goal? Uh, in my mind, it's like, you're trying to, it's a velocity of money type thing. You're having money deployed into typically, I imagine a flip. Um, 
start to finish might be six months or something like that. And then you're trying to turn that money over quickly again. So that means, because if you're getting 10, 12%, whatever yours is, you know, you're able to actually have a much higher annualized return if you're able to turn money at 10% every six months. Yes. I mean, there is that 100%. There's totally that aspect to it where you're able to work with a borrower. And then for example, most of my loans are only out for three to four months because oh, right I'm on. very specific on what I'm willing to, to lend on. And especially in this environment, I don't want cash deployed in something that's a small single family, you know, for long periods of time, because I'm a little wary about what the forbearance wave is going to do to the market in general. Um, I think our market specifically is kind of fairly well insulated because we have a high level of government, federal government jobs here. So our unemployment rate has not dipped nearly as much as some other markets. Uh, but yes, every three to four months, you know, that capital is coming back in with the interest earned. And then it's generally going right back out the door, oftentimes to that same borrower because of the type of borrower I like to work with. You know, it's just text me, you know, we've done multiple deals together. So at this point, just text me an address. Let me do the due diligence on the property. And then I can say yay or nay, and where do I why, where do I wire the cash to? Um, so it, it does get progressively easier if you find you know borrowers that you consistently have you know good success with, you know good relationship with, very collaborative environment with. Then it's no problem, you know, just kind of it very much becomes a set it and forget it business model. Yeah, with with this decent amount of front end work because you got to mm -hmm. get the lending lined up, you got to make sure yep. you have your deeds and notes and all of that your problem yeah so um but that, i think that's key that you mentioned sorry it was just no, no, okay. the re having to do things with the same person over and over because because if you're having to revet the wheel revet people i mean i'm sure you're probably looking to people will leave your network and you mm -hmm. need people to fill it in so you're you know you're kind of having new potential borrowers come in but that takes some time to vet them. It's the same thing with the, the, the syndicators. You want to have a uh, get to know them process, which is sometimes not, not necessarily direct with them. It's observational as much yeah. as possible. Yeah, I mean, I'm as far as potential borrowers go, like I'm going to ask them for three professional references. So three people who have worked with them in some capacity in real estate, you know, whatever, whatever timeline you want to give it. Um, but then I'll contact those professional references and then I will ask them for other people that have potentially done deals with my potential borrower. So that second uh, tier, that second ring uh, of people, uh, and, you know, being from Louisiana, they call it the Cajun underground. Um, so <laughs> like real estate has a real estate underground, you know, everybody kind of knows yep. a lot of things, you know, that mm -hmm. they might not necessarily publicly talk about, but when you get into a conversation one-on-one, -on -one, you know, kind of what's your impression of this person or how did this deal go down? You know, and LPs will do that with GPs, you know, they'll be like, Hey, is anybody invested with, you know, Sam Hunt, you know, and like, okay, well, yeah, I have, you know, Oh, do you mind talking offline and let me know what your experience has been, you know, da, da, da. So, you know, the real estate underground, I think is just a, a vein of gold in the mountain, as far as I'm concerned, like that's, once you find it, that's the community you really need to tap into. Because going back to your, your previous question about where do people start finding operators, if you're completely you know, uh, outside real estate, you're just kind of taking your first jump into real estate, I would really tell people to figure out what you're trying to gain from investing. Because, you know, as far as syndication goes, you know, there's kind of two kind of broad, what I would, what I personally consider kind of broad categories for projects. They're either very cash flow intensive or they're going to be very equity multiple intensive. And I personally like the first one, especially given this particular market. I'm, I'm not want someone that banks on appreciation in any space. Um, so, you know, I live on a monthly cash flow basis as far as my household expenses go. So I want monthly cash flow coming in for my income side of that balance sheet for my household balance sheet. Um, so, you know, really figuring out, are you setting aside this money for five years for a five-year hold time because you want to triple it in those five years? You're looking for a three X multiple, or are you someone that you just want those quarterly distributions coming in, you know, consistently for the next five years and not that you can't have both of those, but you know, there tends to be, if you're going to have a, a higher cash distribution, you're going to generally have a lower equity multiple coming in because the GPs, you know, they need their their money, their time has been spent putting this deal together. So I'm all for paying the GP team, 
Uh, but generally, you're not going to see a deal that's got, you know, massive cash on cash return and a massive equity multiple, especially given the, the kind of the market we're in right now where, you know, cap rates are compressing, um, you know, something that was an eight cap two years ago is now potentially a five cap, you know, it's just, that's kind of the, the world we live in right now. So I'm definitely on the side of the you know, equation where I want consistent, steady cash flow coming in. If the equity multiple is bigger than like 1.5 in five years, you know, then, okay, sure. You know, I think that's great, but that's not my prime reason for investing. I want cash flow coming in. So when someone's evaluating, you know, does this GP team make sense for me? Does this deal make sense for me? That's really where I start. I'm like, what are you after? You know, are you, are you someone that's in their, your mid twenties and you want to triple your money in five years? Then here, you know, here's some heavy lift, you know, maybe development projects. You know, those are the GPs you want to start looking to. Uh, and maybe you have a specific market you really like, you know, there's other people that they're like, they love Florida, they love Texas, they love Idaho, you know, and so, okay, well then start finding people that are operating in those specific markets. So that can help you kind of find GP teams that way as well. Yeah, I mean, that's all great. Because I mean, even just very simply, you could live in a market, even if you wanted to invest in your backyard, if you're in coastal California, generally speaking, you're not in a cash flow market. So if you wanted to do it actively in your backyard, you, you still might not be able to hit those. Uh, you know, we joke about it all around. You go to Costco, I got to bring that money. I can't bring appreciation, you know, or I can't yeah. bring depreciation for that matter either. Um, you actually have to bring them cash. Uh, so that's a great way to be able to diversify. If your market around you doesn't fit your goals, you can find one that does. By, Absolutely. By leveraging other people's knowledge. Uh, I just wanted to hop back real quick to yeah, that. Yeah, I was going to say that vein of gold, that kind of underground information. Two things come to mind. First of all, we are a very small community. People don't think so, but yep. reputations <laughs> spread both ways, and I think that's where you're going to find those, you know, twenty-two percent IRRs when they're really delivering eight. So I think tapping into some of those references of references or friends of friends or, you know, reaching out and asking, you know, let's talk offline so that it's a little more um, off the genuine. books. Genuine, yeah. And genuine, right. And so you, I think that's, I think people forget how small it really is. Yeah. Sure. Um, it feels, it feels like, oh, you know, you're, you, you only know three operators. So that must be all the operators out there, but when you get talking to people, you know, you'll, you'll hear of markets you've never heard of before. You'll hear of operators you've never heard of before. And it, it doesn't even really, cause some people are like, oh, well, I can't go to the conferences to go meet operators. And I'm like, I've yet to go to a conference. That's not, that's just not my, my thing. It might be in the future, but I'm not going to go a lot of conferences. It's just kind of FaceTime getting to know someone. And, you know, in the digital age, I can do that on zoom. You know, I, I don't necessarily need to sit down at a table with them during a conference. And cause they tend to be very structured, you know, the, the guest speaker is this, the next speaker after that is that, you know, and, and that's great to get some information and introduction, but am I going to invest with someone because I saw them at a conference? Probably not, you know, I, that might be my initial how I met them, but I'm not going to invest with them solely because I met them at a conference. Yeah, the conference is, uh, I think they're great because you get a ton of information quickly and it mm -hmm. opens up the rabbit holes. Yep. You're like, oh man, this guy spoke about blah, blah, blah. I'm not necessarily interested in that particular person, but the subject matter that he spoke of, now you can go down that rabbit hole. So you can get a lot of information quickly in a weekend. And, um, but if that fits your lifestyle, right? So it goes back yeah. to the invest passively so you can live actively. Your real estate investing style goes back to your lifestyle. So if you want to go, you and absolutely can and do yeah. all those things and meet people. And I know for us, you know, the first, like the first one that I went to, I went to like all the talks. I sat in on all the talks yep. and I'm like, okay. And I'm taking notes and I'm like, I'm focused. The second one I went to, we took a long lunch. We went out and had a little drink. So it was a little less, I mean, I did go to many of the talks, but I didn't feel that same pressure. So it, and that I think reflected my growth as, you know, in this space, but like the first time, oh, I thought I have to learn everything. And then I'm like, oh, I knew more than I thought. I think I can, you know, go have a, you know, a tasty beverage in the afternoon and just get to know somebody a little better. So. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. It, yeah. For relationship building, 
Right. You, you might have seen them at the last one. Now you're seeing them again. You're like, oh, you're still in the game. Hey, let's go have a sandwich. Yeah, whatever. Uh, let's talk about Mission First Capital. So here's yeah. yet another way that uh, you could be active slash passive. So this is fund investing. Um, you, I, I already know you know far more about funds than I do because you're actually working in one. So take it. What What is Mission First Capital and how is that a little bit different than um, this will probably tie in more to multifamily investing as a true syndication. So talk about funds, talk about a little bit of the difference between investing in a single syndication and then investing in a fund. Yes. So the fund model, so Mission First Capital's aim is to offer the ability to invest in multifamily real estate without having that that large overhead that because a lot of minimums are you know twenty five thousand fifty thousand they you know they only go up from there uh, and most of the people that we kind of come across in our circles with Mission First Capital we are all very military centric I'm a military spouse the two key managers one's an active duty service member still the other one is a veteran. So we are very kind of entrenched in that community. Most of our circle is in that community. But with, the, with that same idea is you also kind of know what their income levels are, you know, and a military spouse underemployment and unemployment was a huge problem even before the pandemic. The pandemic has not helped us in that capacity. So a lot of times it's households that are genuinely just living on one, maybe one and a half incomes as opposed to what you know, a normal civilian family would have two, you know, two parents working, two income households. That's not a reality for a lot of military families is having two consistent income earners in a household. Um, so when we got talking with them, you know, it was just like, yeah, you know, I love this deal. I love what you guys are doing. I would love to invest in real estate, but I don't have fifty thousand dollars that I can throw into this particular deal. You know, I just, I just don't. And we thought, okay, you know, there's got to be a way where we can help people have some alternative, the, the military retirement systems called TSP. There's gotta be, have, have to be some way to offer service members an alternative to the TSP, you know, something where they can put cash aside, you know, they get, a, they get their big nuke bonus. So, you know, $30,000, you know, chunk at a time. A lot of times the, the younger guys, you know, are gonna go out and get the Dodge Viper, you know, they're gonna go get a big truck, you know, they're gonna buy a motorcycle. They're gonna buy some depreciating asset with that big bonus money because no one's having the conversation with them that, Hey, you know, you're, you're 22 and you just got a $33,000 check from the military. You know, maybe you want to do something with that. That's going to be more productive for you in the future. And also giving them the mindset that, you know, retirement doesn't have to look like you just live on half of your base pay in 20 years that you can actually have a more fruitful you know, life beyond that, you know, other than just signing yourself up for another, you know, maybe government service job when you get out of your first government service job, you know, which is also kind of another key avenue for a lot of service members when they hit that 20 year retirement. So what we did, you know, in our kind of exploration of how do we help these people? How do we allow these people to get involved? Uh, the fund idea came up and we did some research and really the fund that the model we chose to go with was a regulation A plus fund. There's lots of different models for funds that might be a little beyond this talk, but we chose to go with regulation A plus because of the goals that we had and the number of people we wanted to help. That's what fit most. Um, so in the traditional syndication model, 506B, 506C, which a lot of your listeners are probably familiar with, for 506B, you know, there's that upper limit that is not a very big number on the number of sophisticated investors that you can have in the deal, which normally kind of ends up dictating, you know, what that minimum amount looks like. You know, if you have a $3 million raise or a $4 million raise, you know, your, your aim is to not have 1,000 investors in your deal. You know, you, you kind of want a smaller LP pool. It's a more manageable number. Um, versus trying to go out and have, you know, a thousand LP investors and everybody's putting in $5,000. You know, a lot of times if you're doing a raise in, in the millions of dollars, you know, you can't have a minimum that's going to be, you know, anything less than $50,000, you know, and still stay within the regulations. So it's not that syndicators are out to kind of exclude anyone. It's just the way the regulations are, are written. And I think a lot of new LP investors don't realize that they, they kind of express their frustration, you know, you know, how am I supposed to get started in real estate investing passively if I need to have $50,000 just to talk to someone? And I'm like, okay, you know, I understand, but it, 
that's not the operators, it's the regulation. Um, so the fund allows us to have a lower minimum because we don't have those necessary constraints on the number of non-accredited investors, for example. It's open to literally everyone. So you don't, you don't have to be a sophisticated investor. You don't have to be an accredited investor. Um, it's just open to everyone. So that allows the minimum to be a lot lower, which like you mentioned is a $5,000 minimum as opposed to the $50,000 minimum. The other key difference is timing. So in a syndication model, you know, you're, you're capital raising for, you know, a couple months and then you close the deal and then you can't invest anymore, typically, unless there's a, a capital call, which is usually not a good thing. Um, but, you know, once you've kind of deployed your $50,000, if the deal's going great, there's no way to go and invest another $50,000 with them. You know, you're just, the deal's closed, you're done. You just kind of have to wait for another deal. And even then there's no guarantee, you know, that deal is going to run as smoothly as the first one, even if you have the same GP team, the same market, you know, everything. But with the fund model, you can actually invest up to quarterly. So if you wanted to, you can invest $5,000 once every quarter. So it allows people, you know, to have kind of a savings goal almost, you know, they could say, all right, you know, if I know I can do this every three months, if I can set aside, you know, $1,500 periodically, I could invest a couple times a year and still get that same return, still be kind of locked in with the same people working in the same markets in the same type of properties, but it's not just here's $50,000 once. So it gives them a place for their capital to start earning, you know, interest for them while they're saving up possibly for some of that bigger, larger expenses. Is it more liquid than a syndication then? No, it's going to have okay. the it's going to have the typical. Um, you can dictate the hold times. So, for example, we have hold times right now that are three years, five years, and eight years. Okay. So, a lot of the syndicate on the syndication side, you know, during their their pitch decks, they'll tell you, you know, we have a projected hold time of five years. But if that five year mark comes around, and they're like, yeah, you know, the market's sketchy. You know, we just had a fire, so the property's not up to you know its full potential. We're going to wait another year or two. You kind of have no real say in that, you know. Whereas in the fund model, if your promised returns are coming in three years, then three years to the date, you're getting that, that capital back. Okay, huh? That's interesting. I like that you're able to continue to make contributions to it uh, over time. Hmm. And that's live. Your that's an active fund that you have now, or are you still building it out? Uh, we are actually just awaiting final SEC approval. So something that oh. every fund has to go through. Yep. Uh, we're literally any day now. I mean, we're, we're recording this on March 1st. So literally any day now. So my ch chances are it'll probably be live by the time this episode goes live. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's interesting. I might have to look into that a little bit more. It seems to be a buzz a little bit right now is uh, doing funds, but uh, that was in my notes and before we went live or recorded, yeah, democratizing real estate investing. I mean, you're actually, you know, it's making an asset class that had been out a little reach. harder. What's that? Out of reach. Yeah, it was, it was largely out of reach for a lot of people because uh, either regulation or, or available capital or uh, positioning. Um, was that part of the Jobs Act or anything, the reggae stuff, or did it precede that? Because I, I remember, you know, crowdfunding, that's when I, I started to, it's not crowdfunding in the sense that there is another regulation that allows for crowdfunding for fractional interest type stuff in real estate. This is slightly different. Yes. This is more of, since people are, tend to be a little more familiar with something like the stock market, this tends to be a little more like a mutual fund. So for okay. example, if you put in your $5,000, you will be a part owner in everything the fund buys. So okay. if they buy a hundred unit complex in, in Raleigh, North Carolina, you know, you're a part owner in that for your $5,000. If they buy you know, a, a 96 apartment units um, in Newport News, Virginia, you're a part owner in that. So it also offers a wide variety of diversification for a small amount of capital. So your $5,000 might be spread across, you know, 600 units. So if one of those properties starts struggling, one of those particular markets, you know, takes a little bit of a downturn, one of the properties catches fire, you know, mm -hmm. your distributions are not going to be as negatively impacted as if you were the sole, that was the sole property you were invested in, in, in a syndication model. Right on. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Um, 
Well, I, we're about an hour in. I think that was a, a, a good spot there to, to kind of drop it before we get too much into the weeds of fund A plus and, and everything that goes along. Maybe we'll bring that up for, for another discussion down the road because that's, that's very interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, just some takeaways off the top of my head, you know, on the passive versus active or a combination, which I think is probably far more accurate than some people realize. Um, even if, uh, you know, on the, certainly on the GP side, it's active passive. Um, but even in, uh, from a limited uh, position, I certainly recommend a certain amount of active involvement on the front end and then ongoing to make sure that you're continuing to be in alignment with, <clears throat> excuse me, whoever you've chosen to do business with. But uh, yeah, syndications, private uh, lending, funds. Oh. Uh, yeah. Wait, I'm going to ask Darren's questions instead. Oh, okay. Is yeah, Darren's not Darren's, here. So. so in you know, in honor of Darren, we're going to, his usual question he likes to end with is a little bit of a mindset question. Is yep. there something that you like have a routine that you do in the morning and the evening, something that keeps you grounded, focused, and in the mindset that you want to be in? Yes, uh, I have a vision board in my bedroom, actually. And the reason I started investing was largely, it's going to sound insane, but I'm a horse person. And as a horse person, I have moved 19 times in 20 years because I'm also a military spouse. So those two worlds tend to collide, you know, because they're not very complimentary. Um, you can't move a horse from Alaska to Hawaii and to Florida all in the same year. It, they mm -hmm. generally don't handle that well. And so <laughs> anybody um, involved would handle that well. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it's just, it's not a thing. Um, but now that he's kind of on the, the sunset time of his career, he hit 20 years last year. So we probably have another five to maybe eight years to go before he's kind of met his career milestones. And I thought, okay, you know, it's, it's time for me to really go back to what I enjoy. And I'm a horse person through and through. I've always been a horse person, even though I haven't owned a horse in 18 years now. I've always been involved in, in that capacity in some way. So I got very clear, like I could tell you exactly what my next horse looks like. I can tell you his name because it's actually my last name on Facebook. And everybody, it, it causes some problems because people think I'm a dude because my name on Facebook is Alex and then Xander. So they put those two together thinking my whole name is Alexander. So they're expecting a, a, a gentleman. And then we pop on a Zoom call and obviously not that you get that little shock factor. And I'm so like- So your parents named you Alexandria Xander so that your name was at that. <laughs> no, the, the right. Xander part is actually going to be the name of my horse. Like oh, that's, okay. I literally have a daily reminder every time, every time I get on Facebook uh, that that's awesome. that is my, that's the name of my horse. And I can, I have a picture of him on my, you know, vision board in my, in my bedroom. So I see him every day. I know exactly what he looks like. You know, I have a whole brush box set that's got his name, you know, kind of laser printed into the, into the brushes. That's how serious I got about it. So right. once I hit a certain threshold of passive income, that's kind of my carrot, shall we say, that once I hit that certain threshold of passive income, I am then going to, Xander's will appear in my life in some capacity through my network, whatever it happens to be, and I'll know it and I'll know it's him and I will be in a position to bring him home. That's, that's awesome. awesome. That's fantastic. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. That is super awesome. I joined a mastermind group and they're like, what's your big goal? And like, I want to get a horse. And, and they're like, no, what's your big goal? I'm like, I'm going to get a big like, horse. I don't know okay, what you're so <laughs> My best friend is a horse person. And I can tell you that is a ginormous goal. Horses <laughs> right. are not cheap to get, to maintain. I mean, and I'm not even just talking financially. They are a giant child they yeah. require so much yeah that's it's it's goal. buying a 1500 pound two-year-old that's never right. going to grow up and they're a lifetime commitment because i mean at my age yeah. now horses can live you know 30 years so i'm talking about basically adopting a two-year-old child for the rest of my life <laughs> well it's great it's, it's not like it's, it doesn't yeah you know, i don't mean it's literally who cares what the goal is the goal is can be anything, but look what it look what it's doing to your actions, though. 
Oh yeah, it's all about the journey. It's, it's all, all about, about the, journey. the journey. Like right. It's exactly. gonna be it's gonna be amazing when he's unloaded from his horse trailer onto the mm -hmm. property. But no, like we're I right now. I mean, I will <laughs> I I know I'm gonna I'm gonna like it's, I'm gonna ugly cry. I'm just gonna tell everybody I'm gonna ugly cry when that happens because I will have known it's been, you know, a couple years worth of concerted effort every single day. Right. A lot. To have yeah. to have him hit the ground. Mm -hmm. No, that's awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing the video on Facebook. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Me, ugly ugly <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, awesome. On that positive note, we'll we'll leave it. So uh yeah, thank you. Get a hold of you. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll drop stuff in the show notes as well. So yeah, if people want to reach out like right now. Absolutely. Uh, so my I am on LinkedIn, like you mentioned earlier. And so they can just search my name. I have my regular name on there because it's more professional. It's Alex Brashears on there. Uh, the Private Lending Lessons is the Facebook group. So I'm all over that. You can happily reach out to me on Facebook, connect with me in the group. And my website is infiniteroadinvestments.com. And there's a little, um, if you're interested in private lending or just kind of how to get started, I did like a little 30 page, you know, info book about the whole process of private lending. So if you're an active investor wanting to learn how private lending works, or you're someone who wants to start private lending, that's uh, a download that you can get from the website as well. Right on. Excellent. I Very cool. will probably take you up on that. <laughs> Come on down. Yeah, I will. <laughs> All right. Well, for the Real Wealth Solutions podcast, uh, we want to thank you. And if you found something that uh, you have a friend or colleague that would benefit from this episode, we certainly appreciate you sharing it. And as always, uh, reviews and, and comments are, are welcome. And uh, I don't know, dramatic pause. I couldn't think of a, a welcome and so and so. In any case, uh, I'm Greg Scully for, for Kim. Alex, we appreciate your time today. Thank you very uh, much. I think Darren's going to be back on the next one. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, he might have been fired permanently. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> you did a great job, Kel Kim. Oh, yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> Getting the mindset thing in. Yeah, that's more his lane. Not that I, you know, it's my lane too, but uh, he's, he's uh, more comfortable in that lane, I guess. I don't know. But in any case, thank you all. We will see you on the next episode. Mm -hmm.